Okay, good. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Don Fisher. I'm the interim principal here. I'm delighted to see so many of you here. And if it's your first time in Green College, make sure you come again. Uh, we have a regular programming like this almost every night of the week, and uh, you're always very welcome. Everything is public and free, and often there's wine and cheese to follow, so there's a little incentive to come as well. I'm delighted to, to welcome uh, Bob uh, Davison as uh, Cecil and Ida Green Visiting Professor. It's our flagship program here at UBC. Uh, first endowed in 1972 by Cecil and Ida Green, it was a university endowment, and the intent then, and of course still, is that uh, uh, academics, leading academics, intellectuals, artists from outside UBC should be invited to come spend a week or so here and give lectures, mix with the community, and in a sense generally enrich the academic culture of uh, our campus. With the creation of Green College in 1993, we took over the endowment, and since that time there's been approximately 200 Cecil and Ida Green visiting professors who've come and uh, enjoyed being here. The usual practice, as it is with Bob this time, uh, the visitor comes and spends about a week with us, becomes part of the college, and uh, often as well gives lectures and other, uh, does other events in, in conjunction with the sponsoring department. I'm going to hand over to to Anna Casas from the Department of French, Hispanic and Italian Studies. I have to practice it all the time. And welcome again. It'll be a great evening. So thank you to all of you for being here today. I would like to start acknowledging that we're gathering today on the traditional, ancestral and unceded ter territories of the Muscan people. I would also like to thank, thank Mark Vesey, Heather, uh, Sara, <laughs> as well as uh, Don for their help making Bob's visit possible, for being so welcoming to my proposal, for your generosity and time hosting him. Uh, my name is Ana Casas and I'm an associate professor of French, Hispanic and Italian studies in the Department of French, Hispanic and Italian studies. Not all of them, I only do Spanish and Catalan. <laughs> And I have the honor of introducing Bob Davidson, uh, who is Professor of Spanish and Catalan and affiliated faculty with the Culinary Research Center at the University of Toronto. He spe specializes in modern peninsular literature and culture with an emphasis on cultural theories of food and hospitality. He is the author of Jazz H. Barcelona uh, that came in 2009 and was shortlisted for the Canada Prize of the Humanities and The Hotel Occupied the Space that came out in 2018. His current work includes a study of material culture and early 20th century Spanish and Catalan narrative, a new uh, research project entitled The Scent of Spain, Fragrance, Other and Culture. He serves as the director of the North, Northrop Friar Center at the Victoria College, as well as chair, he's the chair of the Manuscript Review Committee at the University of Toronto Press. And in 2002, he was awarded the 34 Premi Josep Batista Roca Memorial Enric Garriga Trullols. And I love it when I have to say things in my own language <laughs> because I can say them correctly. And um, he often adds in his blurbs that he takes his martini with a little bit of vermouth and an olive, a, li a little bit extra vermouth and an olive. Uh, what he does not add who's to his blurb is that he has been for years a rock to colleagues, an incredible and generous mentor to several generations of scholars for whom he serves not only as an intellectual model, but also a model of balance between work and life and love towards our profession. And Bob, I can thank you enough for that. Uh, thank you to all of you, and uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, first off, let me express my deep thanks uh, and gratitude to all of you for coming out um, to see me and to visit uh, Green College. Also, um, deep thanks to interim principal um, 
Fisher, principal-elect Cunliffe, and of course, Mark, who was the first principal of Green that I met, for the very generous uh, invitation to be here during the special week when you celebrate your founders, Cecil and Ida Green. Heather and Sarah, you made everything seamless. Thank you very much, and thank you to uh, Anna for your very generous introduction. What can I say? Through your own stellar work, you continue to make me look good, So I, uh, and I bring best wishes from all your friends at U of T. And I'm lucky to have a lot of friends from U of T here, so that's great. To everyone who has come out on this Tuesday evening or is watching online, where's the camera? Um, back there. Um, thank you very much for your time. I will endeavor to subscribe to the first rule of keynote or invited lecture, do not be boring, over the next three hours that we'll spend here together. <laughs> kidding, kidding. We don't truly appreciate our sense of smell until it's temporarily gone. Yet even still, it doesn't get much respect. In the hierarchy of the senses, sight's reign has been indisputable with hearing following close behind. Meanwhile, smell and its erstwhile companion taste have long been treated as an afterthought amongst the humanities. Smell, on account of its ineffability, a lack of dedicated vocabulary to describe it, its gender coding in moral issues, and its long perceived connection to illness and disease. Taste, because food and drink couldn't possibly be serious subjects, and because kitchen work, of course, has always been devalued, once again on gender and class grounds. Things need to change, though, so smelling the humanities, it is. Okay, I admit that my title is a bit weird, but that's exactly the point. Other versions sound normal, even cool. Seeing the humanities, thinking the humanities, even hearing the humanities. The alliteration helps, no? But tasting, feeling, smelling the humanities, it's like we're doing something dirty. And actually, we are coloring outside the lines, aren't we? By activating those senses in such an unanticipated way, we move into a space where the metaphors change just enough that we become aware of how vision-centric things really are. While the common notion of seeing is believing has dominated Western thought for centuries, we are slowly becoming attuned to other ways of knowing, something that is clearly patent also in the gradual opening up of the West to indigenous epistemologies. And actually, in an age where increasingly we can't trust our eyes, I would venture that smell tells us a lot in any given moment. If you stop and think about it, it's a deeply powerful sense that can invoke instant physical responses in us, both good and bad. And as a result, profoundly um, influence and shape how we interact in social spaces. As COVID-19 has unfortunately made clear for many, smells a part of our lives that we often take for granted. And while Proust's Madeleine famously connected taste to memory, the actual phenomena of how we savor things um, and why emotions lock in with such power to transport us through space and time has been linked directly to our sense of smell. Research in olfactory culture is a field on the rise across the board, from humanities to bioscience. Now, I'll be the first to point out that I'm speaking under an umbrella of ideas that have been, has been a large part of the work of many stellar scholars and educators for, for decades. Constance Klassen, David Howes, Carolyn Korsmeyer, Anthony Sinat, Jim Drognick, Alain Corbin, SFU's Laura Marks have all paved the way for lesser senses, such as smell and taste, to be considered seriously by the academy. But while academic vogues can often be cyclical, Think of the many fashionable turns that occur every few years. Um, what does change quite radically is the context in which we live and teach, especially re-tech in the classroom. By now, we all know the easy convenience of a Zoom lecture or a call, right? Oh, and it's one I can turn my camera off for? Excellent, right? Presence without presence and often without attention. By the way, I see you people at home uh, mixing martinis. Oh, no, that was me um, in my recent past. So if pandemic teaching taught us one thing, it's that the humanities needs humans, right? Being together changes the way we do things, the way we learn things. To put it in academic ease, it's a multi-sensory mode of communication and exchange that allows for nuances that technology has not yet been able to replicate. So many words to describe something so simple and up until recently a given. Reading Alonso Quijano's self-creation of Don Quixote together or discussing the death of Emma Bovary are patently different when you share the same space. 
But that said, as my colleague Dan Bender is, is fond of observing, the hierarchy of the senses is still in full force at the university. In a typical classroom, you're not allowed, you're only allowed to do two things, right? Watch and listen. No active feeling, no tasting, and no smelling. And that, I argue, is what we need to change. In the face of declining enrollments, attacks on the so-called utility of the humanities, justify, measure, and the rise of the virtual and AI, it's more important than ever that we destabilize this hierarchy and incorporate smell and taste into both our research and our teaching. By doing so, I believe that we can activate ourselves and our students in novel ways. And through a process of, perpetu of perceptual enrichment that promotes sensory subjectivity, both in and outside the classroom, together contribute to transformative or transformational learning. And I borrow the perceptual uh, enrichment notion from La Chance, Aimant, and Vigny, and their idea that it helps people in, be in their body in a different way through conscious sort of awareness, right, in a pedagogical setting, too. Sociologist and educator Jack Mesereau famously theorized transformative learning as a way to combine individual growth and social development such that we collectively humanize our worlds by recognizing the oppressive, unfair, or unsustainable aspects of the discourses by which we live. Now, I'm not saying that smell and taste can do this sort of heavy lifting on their own. But what I am suggesting is that the type of sensory learning for which many of us are advocating <clears throat> can contribute to a broader understanding of context, which is part and parcel of the stronger sense of community that emerges in Mesereau's model. By facilitating understanding or knowledge transfer through a more synesthetic, intersensorial framework, I believe that we can contribute to transformation in ourselves and in our students. And you know what? Change doesn't always have to be painful or disruptive. It can involve hedonic empathy. Instrumental and communicative learning can add and expand, especially in olfactory and taste situations, where we cast off this asceticism of the academy and our understanding of context is broadened and challenged by direct sensory experience. That in turn makes us more aware as embodied sensing subjects. So let's insist on the human in all our senses and keep this transformative element in mind as we go along, okay? So let me, I'm gonna point out that my title screen was created by that little mini AI designer embedded in PowerPoint, right? And I just typed in smelling the humanities to see what would come up and this is what it gave me. And I think I like it because it kind of tells us the associations that the machine um, assembles around these terms. And here it's like someone has blown their nose on the slide, <laughs> right? Maybe in a humanistic way. Um, and now check out the alternatives it gave me for smelling the archive. First one, very, very nice. Check out the second one. I'm not big into cats, so I'm gonna go back here. All right, part, part one. I wanted to do like in, have you seen Asteroid City? Right, when the, the general goes to start his talk and he goes, he's very, he's very steady and he stands there and he goes, chapter one. I just love that. <laughs> Smelling the archive means not only approaching traditional archival material from new angles, but also being open to a radical change in what we imagine an archive to be. Let me talk about both briefly and then we can smell something that I found and used in class. And we can already smell it, right? Because it's being blown across. The first notion entails approaching archival um, material from a new sense. Now, I'm tempted to say look through a different lens, but I'm trying to cut back on all the vision metaphors that I use, right? And, but it's really hard. And being open to using synesthesia as a method of investigating meaning in new forms. And here, Mark Smith's intersensorial approach to history underpins the way in which we can look at what has been deemed worthy of preservation and through its absence, that which has not, okay? By challenging the manners in which traditional archives, uh, which we could all argue have a multi-sensory potential, right? Like think about it, just because of it's a photograph doesn't mean it's a strictly visual, a visual art, like archive, right? And one thing I do, I taught a, a sensory class sensorial Spain class last semester, and the first thing we started out was I put up some archival photos of markets and things, and I said, all right, describe this image, but don't tell me what you see, right? What do you hear? What do you smell? And sort of just, just forcing us to change that a little bit, okay? But this fact that often the idea of archives, like they don't have to be reduced or limited to dominant senses, 
by changing that, we can change the chip, as the Spaniards say, and open ourselves to alternative archival findings and the production of a dialogue that places a practice of intersensorial humanities inquiry instead of, or that generates, instead of a, an assembly, sort of assemblage of discrete methods, right? Which, of course, is fine for traditional you know, needs and means. Synesthesia comes in as a methodology when we seek to interpret other senses or senses via others and by accepting how the senses blend in our experiences, both past and present. Now, I think we can normalize this type of inquiry by recognizing that in many cases we may already be doing it, especially in cultural studies. But it would be productive to do so more mindfully. Okay, that's cool, you may be thinking, but why? So what if things are limited? Why is this important? Let me tell you what I think. It's important because in limiting the ways in which we consider our collective experience as held and organized by archives, we have been effectively alienating parts of ourselves from ourselves. By valorizing only one or two types of sensory experience as knowledge vehicles or as knowledge itself, we have limited our range of understanding and foreclosed on deep sensations like smell and taste that comprise an incredible amount of our daily experience and make up a wealth of knowledge that we don't even consider knowledge. So let's ask weird questions of the archive. Let's find, let's see what we can find when we just adjust our sensorial compass a tad. I encourage all of you to think of how training a so-called lesser sense on something you know very well can provide a new perspective or validate, activate, unearth, you know, a different way of understanding something. Smells and tastes communicate things that can be hard to put into words because we're not used to doing it. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. My favorite example is to think of the smell and taste of a good tomato. Now, March in Toronto is hardly the best time. Maybe Vancouver's better. I hope so. No? Okay. <laughs> Perfect. But think of everything. Think in your mind. Think of a good tomato, right? Think of everything that's communicated by the senses engaging with that tomato. I don't know what comes to your mind first. Maybe it's the smell. Maybe it's the taste, right? Um, at first, it seems hard to articulate. But also, if I just say a good tomato, you know what I mean, right? Um, but there's many elements that are easily brought into discourse, right? Such as the tomato's origin, the varietal, our memories of tomatoes in general, how it builds other flavors, right, with umami. It's possible cultural significance along with freshness, ripeness, its actual flavor in the mouth. And actually, this is making me, as I was writing this, I was thinking that those seed banks, right, they have those seed banks in Norway and the permafrost and things like that, should be thought of as archives of smell and taste in their own right. Now, and oh, see, I've, I love talking about food. So I go every, more, every Saturday morning to the, the St. Lawrence Market, and the, the South Market has the Mennonite farmers who come. And now I, I kind of hate potatoes, but I put, in my, I put in my ballot for best husband of the year last week, and I actually bought some potatoes and cooked them. But they were potatoes from 1850 called La Rate. That these, it was a variety from France that these Mennonite farmers had been doing forever. right? And I just thought, how easily are those varieties changed, lost right? in these different tastes? And of course, they weren't be, they were, it was written on a little piece of cardboard. It was not... You know, it was not really like if you think if you think, oh, we, maybe we can get you an Instagram, you know, get someone to like be a, an influencer for your potato. I, they would not go for that. Anyway, so now in my in the case of my present research, which is on the you know the smell of Spain in the 20th century, which some of you have heard I me, mean, I guess a year a year ago, a year and a half ago, talk about here. Um, this different approach to the archive means specifically seeking out olfactive adjacent material related to the Spanish modern experience in conventional holdings. Things like print media related to product promotion, news stories about scents and odors, historical documents relating to the Arabic olfactory practices that used to be part of the Iberian experience, perfume and cleaning manuals, government legislation around scent, hygiene and public cleanliness, corporate communications, as well as representations of scent in art, novels, and films in which maybe scent or smell or stench plays an important role. The task when working with these types of materials is first to identify them and evaluate whether or how an intersensorial approach might contribute to a deeper understanding or interpretation of what they may offer solely at a visual level, because often we look at it and we think, oh, that's cool, but how do we push further? 
And, and this is the thing about the digitalization too of the archive, which is great, although horrible, because what's the excuse? If everything's digitalized, why do we have to go, right? But remember, and if at any time someone says, you don't need to go, it's digitalized. We are at the mercy of whoever was doing the digitalizing, right? And you know, on, if on that day they didn't do the ads in this magazine and you want to study the ads, well, you have to go. Okay. Now, once we've done this a few times, it's possible to pinpoint recurring tropes and aesthetic and like aesthetic or rhetorical techniques related to issues of class, gender, race, and especially during periods of dictatorship, and Spain had two during the 20th century, um, ideology, and see how they also inflect our understanding of smell in the past. So the first part of the century approach to archives that I'm describing is open to the rich sensorial valence of traditional font, right? The second brings into question what constitutes an archive in the first place. Here's where material culture scholars have been playing for a long time. Okay, and where those of us interested in smell particularly are able to go for first-hand experience of the different texts that we study. I'm talking, of course, about extra-institutional archives like flea markets, antique shops, online sellers like eBay. I'm also interested in weird niche and company or factory museums, but you'll have to invite me back if you want to hear that part. Always leave them wanting more. In these informal archives, one can find a wide variety of materials, sometimes organized, oftentimes not, but part, all part of the detritus of daily life, objects that have been relieved of use value and are now subject to a new market, that of the collector. I find these archives really fascinating. And it's like going to a supermarket in a new country, like the country you visit. Um, you can learn a lot through a place, you know, with, through its junk, as my mom would say. This is junk. For researchers, though, access to physical specimens is priceless, and in my case has meant that I've been able to directly experience many of the vintage perfumes, colognes, cleaners, soaps, and olfactory-related uh, ephemera that I'm studying. And because smell is a time machine, it allows us to inform and connect our sensory perspective in a direct vital way to the past. This is especially useful and effective in the classroom. Smelling together elicits a wide variety of responses, not unlike reading together. And while elaborating on context is helpful, the raw experience of scent is intensely subjective. Now, since you've been so patient, audience, let's combine both aspects of smelling the archive and put our noses, as the perfume people say, um, on a very interesting perfume from the 1920s that's part of my book project in, uh, on scent in Spain. And at the same time as we smell these, so yeah, just pass those around. <clears throat> if you're sensitive to smell, maybe don't. So you want to hold it by the fat end, or the wider end, and smell it like that. And then I'll give you some. And as we go, I'll tell you, some people have heard this before, but we're not really taught how to smell either, right? So one, one thing that's very, very clear is that our, our nose gets tired quickly. So if you want to keep a scent going, hold it the other way. Other, there you go, because I sprayed this scent. If you want to keep a scent going, you have to sniff like a dog. Now, I'm not going to do it for posterity, but I, you can all do it. But that's how you do it. That's how you keep the scent going. All right. So just have a smell of this. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Take a second. See what comes to mind. Uh, talk to someone around you. What do you get? This is from this is from around 1926. It's called Maderas de Oriente. Does everyone get some? No. Okay. So <clears throat> These are two ads for the Eau de Cologne Maderas de Oriente, Woods of the East, of Eastern Woods, which was created in 1918 for Mirurgia by Lucien Maisonnier. The ribbon on the tree on the image on the left reads, each bottle contains the seductive appeal of the dreamy East. The ad on the right is for facial powder that has been imbued with the same scent as the Eau de Cologne. In the drawing, we can see the original conical flask, reminiscent of an anaphora, along with its wooden case with printing on it that resembles branding and has a blue and green wooden ta woolen tassel to give it a Moorish or Byzantine 
appearance. And actually, I didn't bring it with me because I'm actually I'm going on a trip after this. I didn't want to truck it up to the Yukon. But I actually have one of these, and it's quite the the feel of it is quite luxurious, right? And this is what it looks like. So you can see this is very very high end um, product. So. How do these pieces of the archive, and then they switched from this bottle, and then after the, when Art Deco came in, this is the art, amazing Art Deco. So you get this incredible combination of Art Deco with Orientalism, right? Um, very, very high level of design. So how do these archival um, pieces smell? Let's see if that question can take us beyond where a, a traditional historical or print culture approach might with its inquiries into artists and styles. For instance, with more time, we might ask, when were certain scents mainstream? What did sandalwood mean in the Spanish context? And given that, that traditional archives do not preserve our, our olfactory materials per se, we need to triangulate, take something from a dossier, connect it to other holdings. In this way, a simple ad you know, for an eau de cologne can take us to the patents archive or the collection where brands are filed. And I'll give a shout out to Rene Congdon at Princeton here for that great chip. Um, these in turn might give us foundational drawings, chemical formulae, narrative descriptions, components that when combined with all of the other ephemera and materials, we can sort of call the olfactory image, right? And obviously this is a synesthetic sort of term. We're going back to the visual, but it's with this idea, with this modifier of the olfactory. Now, luckily, because I've been looking in the, the informal archives that I just mentioned, I found some different versions of this actual perfume. So now that we've smelled it, I hope, like, what, what, what comes to mind before I sort of describe this? Do, is it, everyone, anyone who's into perfume will know about Fragrantica, right, which gives the uh, notes, descriptions, and you can get the reviews. And if you click on the bad reviews, they're so funny, right? Like, this smells like a barbecue lit in my bathroom, right? <laughs> For the Tyrannosaurus Rex one from anyway, any any anyone have any anything jump to mind? Any associations or powder? powder? There's definite powder here. Now this, because it's so old, has lost all of its citric top notes, right? So originally this was so this was made with cedar from Lebanon, Arabian sycamore, and sandalwood from Indochina, and it's a floral aromatic a bit soapy, right? Originally, it would have had top notes of bergamot, orange, and coriander, but now we mainly get, and here's the thing also with olfaction, because we don't practice a lot, as soon as things can be on the tip of our nose, and as soon as I say the next word, you're going you're gonna to smell it when I say carnation, right? So there's carnation there. Iris, some Bulgarian rose, less sandalwood than one would think in a, one, in a perfume called Madera, and there's musk under all of it with a hint of vanilla. So now smell it again, now that I've told you what some of the notes are, right? And what they did was, I don't know if you can see, but in each piece, they put a piece of sandalwood in each jar, in each flask. So there'd be a little piece of sandalwood either in it or alongside it, okay? So what do we make then of the combination of the name, the advertisements, the packaging, and the smell itself? From the fragrances paratexts, we infer that we are smelling, you know, that what we are that, that we are smelling what was once coded as exotic and sensual, right? And thus, the question that comes to mind from a cultural studies perspective is, what does it mean that a Spanish perfume house, Catalan actually, would adopt the same orientalizing perspective that had been trained on the entire country by a northern Europe that saw Spain as its own form? of exotic other, right, for the longest time. And I'm thinking here not only of the Carmen image, but the, you know, the sexualized Spanish woman, but also earlier notions that held uh, in Spain to be in the, in the historian Bolufer's words, quote, a liminal area that could trigger the imagination and be perceived as a borderland between Europe, Africa, and the Orient, end quote. So it appears that in the case of Mirurgia, there was a further east, right, a plus orientalum, that they imagined in olfactory and design terms in the form of pro other products like Hindustan, Morisca, Rosa de Baghdad, and the one you have right now, Maderas de Oriente. On the one hand, I find this kind of wielding of the orientalizing impulse to be telling. I think this displacement of the othering corresponds to that aspirational element that perfumery taps into. 
So my question that I'm still working on is, does olfactive European modernity entail or require imagining how a fantasy East right, might not only look but also smell like? Does then offering the olfactory, that olfactory image to a domestic market serve as a way of kind of recentering oneself from a peripheral position because Spain was on the periphery. Is this how you get closer to a European, you know, thus providing, you know, a sort of olfactory cover for Spain's own disavowed Arabic legacy, right? Oh, no, we don't have sangre pura, right? And what does its success mean? And then on the other hand, I think that actually smelling the product definitely makes the exercise more immediate and important, right? even though sometimes it's hard to articulate this. But um, even though we are out of its time, having access to even part of the fragrant smell allows us to feel this archive in a different yet compelling way. Okay. Again, AI. After trying to augment now our sense of smell and apply it in new ways, the move to taste promises to be less complicated, right? However, while the idea of tasting the text, and here we have the PowerPoint AI's designer's impressions of those words, may seem much more conventional, just open your mouth and let the typewriter key hit your tongue, <laughs> taste still, isn't that amazing? Taste the text, all right, funk. Um, <laughs> it's pretty interesting, the text hasn't been written yet, right? But the taste is sort of like, this is the paper your tongue, um, Taste still has trouble gaining traction, both as a subject, mainly when attached to food, less so as a sociological phenomena, right, Bourdieu, and as a methodology for exploring our world and better understanding how it informs our existence. Tasting the text is catchy and has been used as a metaphor for studies of cookbooks and cuisine history. It can also be literal, but don't worry, I'm not going to make you drink perfume. By savoring our subject, we gain new insights in the, forms of, in the form of sensations that are above and beyond traditional approaches to learning. Sensational pedagogies such as smelling, cooking, and tasting, I would argue, can readily contribute to a better understanding of the material and sensorial contexts that make up culture. Of course, promoting this take means getting past the folkloric stigma that many in academe attach to the study of food and drink. And this is especially bad in the modern languages, right? Where food has been treated as a really ossified uh, marker of culture, almost impervious to change. And this folklorization goes hand in hand with the pejorative gendering of food, adjacent activities, and a concomitant undervaluing, again, of kitchen labor, right? To which I'll return. First, though, I thought we might enjoy our own tasting of something that is both incredibly basic and quite divisive, water. Vichy Catalan mineral water, to be precise, which is part of my ongoing, pro I'm doing this project on terroir. And if you don't know this water, you're in for a treat, or at least a new experience. As the cups are going around, <laughs> I'll briefly, yeah. <laughs> Celeste, do you mind just helping? If that, I don't know if she's already filled that up. Oh, no, okay, it's not quite right. Don't chug it back yet. Feel it. Smell it. So as the cups are going around, I'll just briefly introduce the product and give you a little primer on how its qualities and taste have come to embody you know, the way in which urban appetites have consumed the rural in both literal and symbolic levels in the area of the world that I study, Catalonia. Okay. And then I'll, I'm going to, Anna, if you can pass me the bottle when we're done, too. This, this water is incredibly salty. If you drink the entire bottle, it's the equivalent of at least one Big Mac, salt-wise. But it is very, very good, and it will help you digest. If you had a big meal before coming here, you can have a little sip. Has anyone had this before? Never? Oh, I'm glad. I carried this from Ontario for you. <laughs> How are we doing on coverage? Pretty well, right? I'm going to get one.
Oh my, so good. Okay, so, of course, historians in the word bichi is a loaded word, right? <laughs> At once a place. <laughs> Anna, Anna, I'll take the bottle. You can open the other one. I do have two bottles. If someone really likes it, I can send someone home with some. <laughs> Does everyone have some to try? Okay. All right. So Vichy is a loaded word. At once a place, a treasonous regime for many, and a category of sparkling water. Those five letters do a lot of heavy lifting. The fact that in this latter connotation, they also bring together science, medicine, and the vagaries of taste is what inspired me to add it to this talk. Also, it's something everyone can drink. I've also done stuff with wine and vermouth and scotch, but sorry. This is... Yeah. Now... It, this starts with a very sweet origin story. So close your eyes and imagine the following scene. You're a Barcelona-trained physician in Girona, which is northeast of the capital. On your various outings in the countryside, you notice that the sheep that drink from this one spring near Caldas de Malabella are particularly healthy, and that the ones who fall sick recover in no time. Yes, you spend a lot of time observing sheep. You decide there must be something to this water, so you take samples and have them analyzed and ascertain that this forgotten font is special. You buy, uh, you buy it and the surrounding lands as well. The seeds for what will become a bottling and wellness empire have been sown. Open your eyes. So this is, this is the, here we see the spa of uh, Tabichi Catalan, which became this spa. A lot of their flanker products, they, do, they have wellness things, all, all sorts of stuff. Now, of course, this tale is a bit too twee to be completely true, and it trucks on the serendipitous. That said, the physician, whose name is Modest Forest, which is a lovely, these Catalan, old Catalan names are the best, was intrigued by the qualities of the water, and indeed, Caldes de Malavella had been renowned for its thermal waters since the Romans established a, a colony there called Aquae Calidae. Importantly, Forest engaged multiple experts from the growing city of Barcelona to analyze the water, and the results pointed to a wide array of possible applications. Not only did it apparently possess anti-inflammatory properties and was suitable as a digestive aid, but it could also treat skin ailments. So if you have a skin ailment, you can pour it on yourself. Stimulate the appetite and help other chronic conditions. What is more, a geologist established physical parallels between the region and the Auvergne in France, where Vichy was an already well-established spring site, thus bestowing extra cachet right, to the product. So it's a miracle water then. You're probably wondering, okay, but what makes it so special? Its terroir is interesting. A combination of the mobility of the source water combined with the mineral content of, earth, of the earth plus time. The water that emerges at the spring comes from rain that, is, that falls and is then filtered by the ground before being collected in deep aquifers, only then to follow a long path until returning to the surface loaded with minerals. This cycle can take up to 50 years. But the quick eruption to the surface, uh, quick eruption allows the water to maintain both its gases and its high temperature. So it comes to the surface at 60 degrees centigrade. Let's taste it then, and I'll tell you how its taste has become surprisingly involved, you know, evolved in lockstep with Barcelona's brand, okay? Um, which itself has become identified with architecture and gastronomy. So have a taste of it. Swirl around, see what you think. Anyone want more? <laughs> Impressions? Good, salty. Now, I did uh, do a tasting of this in Bologna not too long ago. It was not as cold, and the Italians uniformly hated it. <laughs> they said it tasted like medicine. What do you think? Nice, good. Anyone want some more? Okay, so depending on your palate, it, it, it might not shock you that in 1890, the Spanish government recognized it as a medicinal water, and shortly thereafter, it began, mar began to be marketed in pharmacies, primarily as a digestion aid. 
Over the years, though, it moved into shops, and its symbolic link to the Catalan land and foodscapes solidified as the water acquired its gastronomic element. That is, it became appreciated for its taste, not only its effects. Its rurality gave it authenticity, and its national aura continued to grow even more when it was declared the official water of the Barcelona Olympic Games, the ones that inaugurated the sort of hyper-mediatized spectacle that we've become accustomed to, to with the enduring image being of the diver in midair with Gaudí's Sagrada Familia in the background. Okay. Now, here's what makes Vichy Catalan such an interesting text to study. And so what I'm doing is I'm bouncing some of my own work off of you during this talk about the senses, right? So you get some, I'll get some input too. With the rise of Barcelona as a world city and one predicated on, really, on architecture and gastronomy, Bici Catalan's subsequent use of the architect's trencadis, right? You know this Gaudí style of using broken... Basically, Gaudí was incredibly ahead of his time in terms of recycling, on-demand um, delivery of materials. He also created work teams, like kind of contemporary, we think of as interdisciplinary work teams. He did the same thing. And here, broken tiles would be put on curves because you could, that's how you can create a clean, you know, you can tile a curve. And of course, Gaudí's buildings have a lot of curves. So, and this, actual this bottle won a uh, global marketing prize and consolidated the move to high-end tables and kitchens, or a move to the high-end tables and kitchens that had already begun in the 1980s. And this is where we see the taste of Bici Catalan moving into sort of a more rarefied sphere with uh, Catalan chefs. And this is the new, the, the newest label with the Trencadis there. Okay? There's still a throwback to the rural, but really it's becoming much more urban. That this process has continued to the extent that the water is now labeled, because you may have noticed, Bici Barcelona for the North American and foreign markets, um, for export markets, is redolent of a larger process at work in terms of the relationship between the urbs and the rural in Catalonia. That it coincided with the beginnings of a culinary revolution that would see a modernized version of Catalan cuisine in many ways uh, lead the way in terms of innovation. If you think about Ferran Adria, have you had foam in your food lately? If not, it, well, if you have, it's, you can thank Ferran Adria. Or you know how they pour the sauce, they pour the soup on directly on your plate. That also, he kind of really kind of made that more popular. All these little things that are, we now take for granted. It's only been 20 years or so, right? Cannot be overlooked. And when considered in this light, the changing of the name to Bici Barcelona um, invariably makes patent a new version of this old dynamic, Catalunya Ciutat. Catalunya is, is the city. Catalunya Barcelona. Vici Barcelona. And thus helps us understand social and economic structures of a region through a unique approach to taste. And while traditional terroir could make a tentative claim here, right, although it's been pushed out, in the relationship between the rural and the urban, the symbolic power of the metropolis imposes itself. And here lays bare a Barcelona appetite, right, this all-encompassing Barcelona appetite that has grown so voracious that it needs to even consume Vichy Catalan, right, to aid its digestion, okay? So now I'll, I'll conclude... After we've done these two case studies, I'll just start this. In her wonderful book, A Sensory Education, Anna Harris writes cogently and convincingly on both embodiment and enskillment in, in, in a multisensory context. She contends that, quote, one does not learn five senses, but rather that sensory education involves a sensing that extends beyond categories and organs. This involves the practitioner in an active engagement with their world as a living, breathing, multisensory, and intersensory body amongst other bodies, end quote. Now, as she points out, while traditional notions of enskillment have revolved around manual proficiencies such as riding a bike or playing the cello, recent work has branched out and considered other um, sensory practices like capoeira, scuba diving, osculation, right, which Tamara Mitchell spoke about last week, and cooking. Now, I'm going to be cheeky and insist on the importance of this last one, especially as it relates to food studies in the humanities, and consider it an extension of my smelling ethos. Put more succinctly, if you can smell things being prepared, cooked, and or consumed, then you're on the right track. 
Which brings me to the manifesto part of my talk, where I return to this notion of perceptual enrichment, but this time not only for learners, but also for teachers. As adult educators know, there can be no transformative learning without some transformational teaching. And here, kitchen sessions in humanities courses offer very, very fertile ground. Bringing students into a participatory, prepping, cooking, and eating environment has proven to be the most effective group activity I've ever been a part of. And I hate group activities. <laughs> and I hate or icebreaker activities. But you know what? Cooking together is like the one thing that I like. In those situations, um, recognizing the role of struggle, right? They talk about this when in you know in, in adult learning, right? Like learners need to struggle, right? And we need to, so we need to recognize the role of struggle in the in the student's adjustment to a new learning environment. And this is important. We need to keep in mind that in addition to paying attention to the cultural text in question, whether it's a cuisine, um, a dish, or we're trying to get a target smell or smells or something, they're also dealing with new technical vocabulary, new ways of physically being in space, hand washing, calling out when carrying a knife, alerting others to how they're moving, retrieving proper equipment, etc. If anyone's worked in the kitchen, you know this is all part of the training, right? and engaging in trial and error as they work together to reach a totally different kind of goal than they, would, they normally might, right? And that, and, and, that this, uh, and that this has continued to be... Oops, no, wrong page. And ideally, students will become part of generating the questions that we ask relating to culture in and around a kitchen as well. And what's the upshot? Why go to all the trouble, right? Why not just have them watch a video on YouTube? You can learn a lot on YouTube. My mom learns a lot on YouTube. I learn a lot on YouTube. Sure, but you can't learn like this. By engaging our university students in the practical work that we normally identify with colleges and polytechnics, we can break down some very old assumptions, right, regarding what is knowledge and what is valid academic activity. So by not just, you know, deferring to the virtual, but rather returning to primary source experience, like we've done briefly today with perfume and water, I firmly believe, as I said at the beginning, that we can activate ourselves and our students in new ways. In a moment when so many in the humanities are entrenching right, themselves, now is the time we should be getting out of our comfort zone and embracing sensory experience as tools for university-based learning. Food studies practically gift wraps this. Right? And let me tell you, it's a great way to get out of your comfort zone. The first time I was going to solo lead a kitchen session with some Spanish culture students, I couldn't sleep the night before. And I can't remember the last time that happened because of a text that I was going to teach the next day, right? So let's upend the hierarchy of the senses and the humanities and smell and taste and do our part to contribute to transformations that emanate outwards with our students and ourselves at the core. Thank you.